Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. On the show today is Caroline Corey. She is an energy healer, a teacher of spiritual studies and metaphysics, as well as a film producer. Her latest movies were Superhuman and A Tear in the Sky, and you'll hear at the end, She's working on a couple of very cool films as well right now. But the conversation kind of went with those two movies about basically superhuman, just about like the power of your consciousness, the power of your mind, like what you're able to create and what you're able to do understand about your reality as well as your inner reality and how your emotions guide you into healing these things and then into a tear in the sky which is about seeing things in space filming the sky to see what they could find and they found some amazing things like the classic things like you know um, a craft making u-turns and you know things that regular airplanes don't do a tear in the sky an opening and then a closing and and what that is and what what they found this is a really good one caroline did a really lovely job and i'm grateful for her because she helped me understand a couple of things that have been on my mind please enjoy this episode please hit subscribe it shows me that the content that i'm putting out there resonates with you and to keep making more of it and the bell for notifications when we have an episode come out as well as the comments. Those are fun to read. So enjoy. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means that there's lots of salt and no sugar. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to any diet or lifestyle. For me, I drink Element all day, every day. I put it in just about every single drop of water that I drink. For me, it feels like it helps keep me full. It helps give me more energy. And I feel like water is absorbed better by the body when it has element in it. It truly feels like magic to me. Receive a free element sample pack with any order when you use drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkelement.com slash pretty intense. We can talk about otherworldly stuff, but I think that it's also fun to talk about innerworldly stuff. Yes. Because (laughs) it's like, I get like reminded all the time how, you know, powerful our intentions are. And even when, even when like I set, like I, I remember to do it this morning, just setting an intention for the day of how I want my day to go energetically And like, without fail, you can make that happen. Absolutely. I mean, I talk to people like you and like spiritual people and people that, you know, can go into very good detail about how to do this and why to do this. And I still forget. So like, I, I, I think that the inner world is, um, such an indication as well of the outer world. So was there some sort of impetus that led you on this path that was guided by your inner world first? Yeah, actually it was an an outer experience that got me thinking. So actually it's when I was a child, I was five Mm -hmm. years old and I had this experience where I was just there and all of a sudden I kind of sensed the presence of like, angelic being, whatever you want to call them. And I realized that, wait, I could see them, feel them, sense them. Uh, What is that about? Of course, I'm five years old. So it didn't really register as something unusual. It was more like, oh, okay, because I have no frame of reference, right? But it was later, um, as I grew up that I started thinking, wait, it's it's, everybody has that or like, how how is that possible? Uh, Is everybody seeing, hearing things or am I crazy? So, so that experience got me asking the questions. And, and I realized that what I was talking about is consciousness. It's, it's something beyond what the average person can see or feel or understand. And that's how I got into the field of consciousness, research, science for years and years and years. And then the more I got into it, I started develop, developing methodologies for meditation. The more I got into it, the more I was like, this is how it's supposed to be. Right. It's from the inside out. 
Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the big questions that started arising in the beginning for you? And do you still have some of those same questions? Actually, the first question was, did I make this up? In my your crazy experience, your yes. experience. Yes, you had? because, because um, how do I know this was real? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I know I didn't project some sort of vision that's not really, that's just in my mind. And so I thought that this was actually a very important first question because you're not just right away taking things for granted and kind of telling people like, hey, you know, I'm hearing this or I'm seeing this or I understand this. And so when you question yourself, I kind of had to put myself kind of on a test and I would be like, okay, well, if what I saw is real, then what's the validation? So for example, I would see someone and I would sense something that they never told me before. And I would say, um, when you were seven, did you have a drowning experience or something? You know, because I would see that information and they'd be like, yes, how did you know? So that's kind of how I started to test myself and collect validation. And then the more I got validation, sometimes I was on, sometimes I was off. Most of the time I was on. And then I said, wait a minute, if I'm on only once, you know, how did that happen? How is it possible even once that you know something that no one told you about, you know, before? Yeah. And so that's kind of how testing myself got me to understand the mechanics of how it works. How does it work? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and develop methodologies and, you know, all of that. Yeah. What did you learn about how this works? So the first thing, when I started to have validation after validation, first of all, the most important thing is I dropped the doubt. Mm -hmm. When you switch from... Is this real? Did I make this up? You know, how does it work? You're just really just co going in circles. Huh. The minute you start to believe that what you're thinking, what you're seeing is real, then the whole mechanism starts to unfold. You see, it's like a kind of like a switch. So that's the first step is to believe that you are in fact creating your reality. Oh, that's a bit of a difference though. Creating versus seeing. Yes. Well, it's or, true. Or coming into awareness of. So get into that because that, yes. those, two, those are two different things. <laughs> and that's what was going through my mind is because when I have that kind of experience or like I'm thinking about something and my life is starting to unfold in ways that I'm I know that I'm thinking about wanting and shoot, some of it's unwanted too, because we don't all think positive thoughts. And I really think to myself, am I in my own little mini universe where I am creating everything is what is real? And, and is there is if I'm creating all of it, then, you know, where is the interplay and the challenge and the growth when all it is, is just me practicing thinking good thoughts and, you know, staying in alignment with myself. So please get into the nuanced difference between those two things about That's sort amazing. of seeing things, hearing, becoming sort of, you know, Claire cognizant in all the ways, all the Claire's versus creating. Yeah. So the creating was actually the result, the outcome of having these experiences. Why? Because when I started to kind of see things or hear things and then get validation mm -hmm. that got me understanding that my consciousness has that sort of power, so to speak. I don't want to say like power, like you're more powerful than other people, but that ability, let's say. So if it does have this ability, then how is it working in my personal life? You see what I mean? So it's like it became as the conclusion 
that your consciousness, your mind is the one creating your reality. So, so I would say, for example, this is a very kind of tangible example. So, okay. So I found out, you know, I saw something and it turned out to be real about this person or that event or something, right? If then I would look at my life, for example, I'm in a relationship, let's say, that's not working. So how come my consciousness, my mind can tap into that thing and boom, get it? And yet in my life, for example, in this area of my life, I'm, you know, with the wrong person or I'm unhappy. Is it? So that's kind of how eventually it, I made the switch or I started to understand that you are the one attracting or creating your day-to-day -day reality, if that okay. makes sense. Okay, okay, okay. Attracting kind of bridges the gap right there. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. So then I would apply the way I was tapping into that information, which by the way, I didn't know. As a child, I didn't know how I was getting the information. I was just getting it. But I'm kind of like a scientist, like an engineer. Like I want to know how, like I just tell me how, because I wanted to do it again. Mm. And I also wanted to help others do it. I did like, I didn't want to just go out and say, hey, you know, I, I did this or this is this or whatever, or just like I'm channeling or something. It, it wasn't interesting. I wanted to understand if I did it once, can I do it again? If I did it two, three, four, five times, then there's some sort of mechanism. Mm -hmm. Can I do it consciously now, you know, without meaning it didn't just come to me? I am consciously wanting to know that information. How would I do it? So that's how I kind of train myself. Like I said, first of all, the meditation. How is my mind currently working? Why is it working this way? What's not working? So I would kind of like test myself. Like I would try to discern between my conscious thoughts versus my subconscious thoughts versus other people's thoughts because believe it or not you can sense other people's thoughts totally so on and so forth and so then with training you start to narrow it down so to speak and you start to say wait okay i want my conscious intention my conscious thoughts but how do i get rid of everything else for example so that I can receive the guidance. So that's why I did meditation after meditation after meditation. And so I would then try different things. And I would say, so people say they meditate and they're connected to the universe. So is that what I should be doing? So that I, so that I would try this meditation, that meditation. And I realized that not all meditations are created equal, <laughs> meaning, uh, you may feel at peace, you may feel calm with certain meditation, but does that specific meditation get you to focus your mind on something you want to create? Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. It's a, so I would notice I would do one type of meditation just to calm myself or something, okay. but then I would do something different when I wanted to uh, do telekinesis, for example trying to move mm -hmm. an object or you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that specificity, I feel is what I was able to develop through my, you know, the methods that I've, that I came up with after all these years. And mm -hmm. so the more specific you are, the more the tools become refined. First of all, the more you understand yourself, mm -hmm. you, you catch yourself, wait, where did this thought come from? <laughs> you know, did I just hear something? Who am I channeling? <laughs> you know, all of that eventually gets you to that clarity or specificity. And then you start to see the patterns. Mm -hmm. Of course, I attracted this person. Of course, I cannot attract financial abundance or what, what have you. Because you start to recognize it's that part of your 
mind, your consciousness that attracted it, your subconscious thoughts mm -hmm. were a lot more powerful and more dominant than your conscious thought. You're saying, right. I want this. And your subconscious mind is saying, I'm not good enough. I'm a failure. I'm not ready. And so on and so forth. So falls into some old programming. Exactly. Subconscious is so good at that programming. How did you become aware of that? That seems like to become aware of your subconscious is seems very hard. I don't feel like I've heard a lot about like becoming aware of that. It's more about kind of seeing the patterns in your life and in your reality. Um, and, you know, I actually just um, interviewed Teal Swan and the whole conversation was about ancestral healing and how critical it is right now to heal these negative patterns so that we can evolve so that we can so that we can use relationships as a, a launching point to um bring humanity into a place of more coherence so how do we like how can we do that do you dive into ancestral memory or healing and the patterns that are established um, like, where does that come from? Where do those negative subconscious patterns come from? So when you look at a pattern in your life or something, you know, when we're not happy in one area of our life, it's actually our guidance system mm -hmm. is sending a signal that says something's wrong. It's like, stop, take a look at this, what's going on. So if you look at what your conscious mind is saying, you're saying, wait, I want to be abundant. I want to be happy, you know? So how come what I'm experiencing is the opposite? So then you start to, to assume, first of all, that another part of you, which is the subconscious, is sending a different signal. So you recognize this signal in many ways, this part of the, you know, the, the work. The first thing is you notice what's manifesting. For example, somebody who's ignoring you, for example, mm -hmm. or somebody who's cheating on you. It's not about them. If you turn it around and say, mm -hmm. what is it in me <laughs> that is accepting or allowing to be ignored, that is accepting and or allowing to be cheated on or something? Or what is it in me that's feeling not worthy or of making a lot of money or what have you? So then you start to recognize these patterns in you mm -hmm. because it's a dynamic. It's like, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit more than the uh, law of attraction, but even just that, you know, by looking at the patterns tells you what's in your subconscious mind. So there's one method. I mean, this is a simple method that anybody can do, but there are other methods as well is regardless of, the person or the circumstance, you through a little bit of meditation and a little bit of training, not, not that much, you start to feel, you intend for the emotions associated with that pattern to come up because the emotions are part of your guidance system. We mm -hmm. think like, you know, we shouldn't feel angry or when we're angry, we should like pretend that we're happy or like say yeah. affirmation i'm happy i'm happy or you know but actually you're not you know yeah right so affirmations don't really work because you're kind of forcing yourself to say something but that's not how you really really feel Ooh. so i prefer to look at the emotion if i really feel bad what's that about I'm not going to pretend and say I'm, I feel amazing when I really deep inside me, I feel bad. So with this exercise, you can, through breathing and like I said, intention, you begin to feel what, you know, where you are struggling. So it's very powerful exercise because yeah. all kinds of stuff starts to come out. Like, let's say, <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, tears or like something that seems irrelevant. And this is where the past life and ancestral thing comes in. So, so all sorts of strange things start to come up. Let's say you're unhappy at work mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you have feelings of being abandoned and you're like, what, like, what, <laughs> what does this have to do with that? You know, I'm mm -hmm. trying to fix my career here. <laughs> 
exactly it. You are tapping into subconscious experiences that happen to you that trigger a, a feeling of being abandoned, which triggers the belief system. See, when you, as a child, when you feel abandoned, not loved or whatever, you come to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Oh, my father left. Therefore, I'm not good enough. I'm abandoned. Um, my father left home. Because, therefore, I'm a failure. I didn't. I wasn't lovable enough for him to stick around. Does that make sense? Yeah. The feelings get you to create belief systems. Right. This, but the second you have a belief system, a new belief system, you didn't. You didn't come in. You you weren't born saying I want to be abandoned. <laughs> you you were born saying, give me love, give me food so I can thrive. That's what you came mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. So, so it was later when you're three or four or five that through these external experiences, the feelings give you change your belief systems. Yeah. They're like, they're like a, they, they, they're like the start of a new code. Exactly. And that's the beginning of the pattern. Mm. Now, at the age of five, when your dad left, you, st- you, you are adding information to your cells, to your cellular memory. Mm. You are saying, yes, I'm a young boy or girl or whatever, or this and that. I have many friends, but also I'm not good enough to keep, to, to keep my father's love, for example. Mm-hmm. You add this information to your cellular memory. As a side note, I want to say that your thoughts aren't abstract. I mean, of course, they're abstract, like you don't see them, but it's an actual charge. It's an actual vibrate, like it's an actual frequency that's generated from your brain. Mm -hmm. Think about it like almost like a wave, right? Like it's uh, the thought is still carries information in the form of a waveform. Exactly. Energy. And and Einstein even said once uh, energy cannot be destroyed, once created, it can be transmuted, cannot be destroyed. So this is a form of energy. This waves, I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. You know, is being produced, right? Where do you think these waves go? They go to other people and they latch onto them like glue and they bring them towards you. (laughs) That. But before they do that, they go into yourself. Yes. Yeah. And so that's why when you do this exercise, you normally you would feel these emotions in certain parts of your body. Some people feel it in the heart. Some people feel it in the liver. Some people feel it in their legs. Why? It's because this is where the weakness after years and years and years from the age of four I started telling myself that I'm not good enough. I'm a failure, blah, 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 you know, for years and years. Then I'm going to keep attracting, you know, experiences that match my new belief system. So mm-hmm. I'm going to attract a girlfriend or a boyfriend who's who's going to abandon me. Same pattern, so on and so forth. Eventually, fast forward, I'm going to attract a job. Do you see what I mean? You see how like you don't think there is a connection? But right. there's a connection with everything. Right. By the time I'm 30, 40, what have you, I'm in a career right. that I hate, but I'm still there to pay the rent or, or what have you. And I am miserable. You've abandoned yourself too. That's why you're there because you abandon yourself and what you really want. So your job is now information about you. I love exactly. that idea. Like, you know, you said when something happens, ask what the question I ask is what's my part? Well, you're, you always play a part, even if it isn't your fault necessarily, doesn't mean you didn't attract that situation to show you something. Exactly. There's, you always have a part. That's the idea mm-hmm. because you are the creator. We don't want to have a part. You'll say, wait a minute. I didn't ca- attract my, create my cancer. I didn't create this. So this is kind of where now we kind of to continue how, how do you undo this and mm-hmm. how do you get to the ancestral part or even past life? Yeah. So, so now here comes a 30 year old person who's very unhappy with work, miserable every day, 
has developed a few illnesses or a few struggle, physical illnesses, because the liver that you've been pouring those thoughts into, I'm a failure, I'm abandoned, I'm not good enough, blah, blah, blah. these thoughts all went to your liver. So by the time you're 30, you have problems with your liver or what have you, right? So you, he comes to you and he says, uh, I hate my job, but I want, I can't get out because I have to pay a rent and I have this physical problem. You know what I mean? It's all connected. Yeah. So the idea with this type of training is as you sit with the emotions, you're going to start to feel, like I said, strange emotions that will come up and you will feel them in your liver. So as you look at the cellular memory with this, again, if, if you're somebody's training, you're helping you, but even you, you can do it with yourself. You, you, you feel these emotion mostly in your liver. So you start to focus on the liver and as if like you, you visualize or you imagine that you have like a zoom, you know, like in a camera. So mm -hmm. you're looking deeper and deeper. Let me feel. Let me sense what is in my liver that's triggering this problem and this huge sense of abandonment and sadness. Mm. And you're going to start to feel and see things. And if you are in this proper alignment, you're probably going to see your dad leave the home mm -hmm. at the age of four. <laughs> So, so then you, when you see, so that basically is the root cause of your liver problem, but also your job situation and so on. So yeah. forth. you see what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes it goes even before you were even born. Mm -hmm. And this is where, because you keep kind of zooming in, you keep going into the cellular memory the cellular memory stores everything of your body. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called memory. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep going deeper and deeper asking, okay, but why did I even attract this father to leave me at the age of four? I came in wanting why love. I, yeah. Why this father? Why this and that? You keep going backwards. And this is where you get into another life and another life and, and, ancestral things and then you keep finding the root cause of what's happening to you in this lifetime and the second you do it's no longer subconscious you bring it up to the surface and it's healed yeah That's the well idea. i've found that too when you like i've done really really positive work with emdr um and some somatic stuff on my own but it's like the, the emotion is what, you know, marks the beginning of a code or the beginning, beginning of any code, a new code. And <clears throat> when there's emotion connected to it, whether it's like healing something from a pattern or even manifesting something, even going into meditation and thinking about something that I want, if I really go into the energy of what it is, how it would feel, taste, smell, the reasons why and just like be there in it. Like I'm now anchored in that reality having happened. It's just a matter of time for this third dimensional reality to prove it out and show me, but it's already happened. And um, so I've, I've had both of those things totally work, which is how I generated my first trip to Egypt, which is how I have changed past memories. It's all through emotion. Yes, exactly. That's what I was saying. The emotions are your guidance system. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't ignore, you can't say, I mean, you can, but it's, a, you know, yeah. you can't say I'm happy when you really are not go to where you're not. It doesn't mean you're going to stay there. Mm -hmm. It just means that it's, it's just a guy. It's just telling you start there. Yeah. yeah. And then when you do, this is kind of where you go in and you undo it. And then you can move into the vision. So what you're saying is very fascinating because what you just explained and shared is means that you're creating from the future. You are creating what you want from that place in the future. 
And that's the most powerful way to create from the future, especially if you, the feeling is so powerful and yeah. it's the real feeling. So yeah. meaning when you're there, you're a hundred percent feeling like every inch of your body. It's, it's you can, I, so I cry. Sometimes I laugh, I <laughs> smile, I get hot. My heart rate gets up like various different visceral e expressions of what, the, what I'm going through. Exactly. So that's the most powerful way. But a lot of people can't do that because as or they think they're doing that. Uh, and again, how do you know? Just look at the, the just look at the feeling, follow the feeling, follow the feeling. So this is actually I do this exercise for all sorts of um, mind matter thing as well. So you set the intention, you say, I want um, to create, a, like you're saying, a, a trip to Egypt or something, yep. um, or something maybe more like your whole life, something like uh, abundance. Let's say you know I'm I'm struggling, check to you know paycheck to paycheck, and so I just want to be free. Let's say financially free, right? So when you say that, and in your case, you were visualizing yourself, you were putting yourself there, you were seeing, you were feeling what it would be like, right? But for a lot of people, you have to kind of first make sure that you are a hundred percent in that place. If not, there's all. This is also an incredible way to bring the subconscious stuff up. So, for example, I really see myself in a beautiful home, and I have no financial worries. Right? That's your intention. And I, I feel great. I, I feel uh, I, I want, you know, I'm, I'm abundant. I'm happy. I'm doing all the things I want to do, right? You're saying that. But deep inside, there's still kind of a feeling doubt. Is this really, really going to, like, how is that going to happen? Like, I have a nine to five job. I have three kids. You know what I mean? Like, so if you don't address those and clear those, then you're not a hundred percent there. You see what I mean? Totally, that's, totally. Because you actually, because it's not even like a. It's this beautiful difference between believing and knowing. Like when you know, yeah. you're yeah. just you're there. But believing is still kind of like, no, I believe I can have money, but I don't feel like I deserve that. I, I will abandon my family because if I get too rich they won't be able to relate to me. Uh, so I will abandon my family maybe or something like that if I, if, I, if I have too much abundance because they spoke about it negatively. Exactly, exactly. So there's all these tools. What we are talking about are these are tools people can use to really, really bring the truth because that, that's what it's about. The subconscious is holding on to things you're not aware of. That's why it's conscious. What about um, to kind of, before we move on to, you know, outer space, um, <laughs> which is so fun. This is awesome. We don't have to. <laughs> um, uh, well, I think it's great. No, I, I really think that what we're kind of exploring is really in, in parallel to your last two movies, which are superhuman and a tear in the sky, which is about your inner world versus sort of outer space. So I think it's kind of good to, to, to bring those in together. Cause I think this is something very tangible for people who are listening, who might not kind of be able to grab on to the time it takes maybe, even though, I mean, Jesus, do you want the reality that you want or not, you know? Um, but someone might not have the discipline. That's a better word, the discipline to do that. So something that can kind of invoke it, I think, is this physical manifestation of issues that um, draw you into needing to understand why it exists. Like, for instance, for me, many times, if there is something that I am not seeing and acknowledging and dealing with, I will get a physical manifestation in my body. I'm not saying like cancer. I'm saying like, oh my God, like my stomach hurts so bad. Like I can't, like, I don't even know what's going on right now. Like I will have it in my body before my mind knows it. 
So what does someone do if they can feel discomfort, dis-ease, dysregulation in the body? What's the next step to going into that feeling in the body to uncover something that they need to know? Yeah. And that's typical what you just said. That's we wait for something to wake us up. And again, it doesn't have to be, it could be like a migraine headache that won't go away. I mean, I'm not trying. I'm not yeah. trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so I think this is what actually happens to everyone mm. and they can just follow what we were just talking about earlier. If you just sit with it before just grabbing a pill, you know, because that's also sure. the typical response, you yeah. know, like, Hey, this is, you know, headache, boom, you know, so just try uh, to sit for a moment and just breathe, like do a little bit of breathing. And yeah, it's true. Like I used to do meditations for hours. Like I would sit for three hours. And then when I started teaching, I was like, you know, not everybody wants to do this or can do this or, you know, so, so I started to simplify everything and charge the meditation with very powerful frequencies. So, you know, so now in seven minutes, you get to where you used to be able to get to in an hour or an hour and a half. That's and my so, kind of speed, girl. Yeah, exactly. So it's all on my website, by on, on my YouTube channel. Actually, it's like they're free because people, I want people to let go of the idea that it's so hard. Like you have to sit for hours and do yoga for three hours. I mean, you know, now if you know what you're doing, which frequencies, uh, if you're, spe- you know, again, specific, what is it that you're asking do you want to just calm your mind? You want to just breathe a little bit, or do you want to focus on what's wrong? How do I fix it now? So and when so- you say frequencies, are you talking about the meditations having Hertz frequencies laid into them? Yes, but it's through my voice. Oh, what? Yes, yes. yes. We should talk about this a little bit because uh, there's proven technology that it's out there now. I'm not saying anything that's extraordinary. Everybody has a specific frequency signature through their voice. It's kind of like a fingerprint. There are no two voice signatures that are alike. And so now with this technology, you can pick up the frequency of your voice to actually, they use it in a medicalist uh, field to see where you have imbalances. They can see cancer markers. They can see all kinds of, without blood tests or anything, just through your voice. And then I work with some people who are developing even software because I told them, I said, can you do this for the average person? Like, you know, so I want to know where I am. What is it that I'm needing right now? Yeah. I could just speak through this software. Yeah. And it will tell me, like it would just reflect back to me the frequency, you know, the frequency, the heart or this or the stomach or the digestive system or things like that. It mm-hmm. can be very specific to even tell you what vitamins you need, even like, like um, imbalances, basically minerals. Wow. Or so if you understand that the frequency is being, embedded in your voice and of course it's going to change every day because you are different every day then you can embed you could be in this incredible state of consciousness again through training and if i am in the in fact we did this experiment if you don't mind me sharing yeah so so i was working with these guys actually in their lab and i said I want to know what my meditation actually does. Like, I mean, I know what it does to me, but I want to like see it visually. I want biology. You want markers, markers. I want metrics. Like I want data, you know? So we did this experiment where we did it through the voice. We were measuring the frequency of the voice, but we also had uh, the EEG, you know, like, like, okay, cool. Picking up like the skull cap that you know wears all the electrodes that shows the shows your sort of neuro neural activity. Right, right, exactly. And so, so I sat down. Uh, so I started doing my, the the meditation that I call connecting to source mm-hmm. because I know that frequency. I live that frequency, like I said. So I know where where it is, but you mm-hmm. don't, or they yeah. nobody. You know, they, it's like what. Right. I'll just say source and I'll get there. Well, that was, that's what I was trying to 
to prove, I mean, to demonstrate. So as I'm going through this exercise and I'm just meditating and saying, the second I would say source, or I would say I'm connecting to social, whatever my meditation is, I would go to that frequency because I have lived it. I've done it. I know where my consciousness, where my brain goes. It's a very specific frequency. So I would go there as I'm saying it. The second I would say that, my alpha waves would like, I would just like jump. And my brain would start to become completely coherent, specifically with certain words and certain tones. And then by the end of it, your your whole I, I in fact it's I think it's on my Facebook I'm not sure but there's those images of the brain where when you start and how you end everything is perfectly like coherent like the colors the organization colors are symmetrical from left to right yes where it's yes. activated yes instead of like right and left and blah blah yeah, blah a blob here a blob there yeah and what was fascinating is the second I would say the word it would go up because I was energetically bringing it through the voice. It was the frequency. So I was like, boom, this is proof that it's not. I love that you get scientific. I love, I love that because it's like, you know, I want to show that it's real. Yeah. So then my friend, she was doing some other meditation or something and her, her chart was nice. I mean, it, it was, it was different. It was just nice. Mm -hmm. And then she does my meditation. She listens to mine and her brain does what mine did. I've always said that the, like, I think that truth holds a frequency. I think the reason why you like someone or you resonate with a song or whatever that may be is because the more in truth they are, the more you resonate with that frequency. Like there's a, it's like a very, it's like a feel good frequency that seeps into you. So, and it just resonates like truth resonates with truth. And so your inner being, your higher self wants more of that, the more truth, the better. And so connecting with that, with people, w whether they're on someone on TV or someone in your life or a, a relationship or a song that you listen to, like you're resonating with the truth and you're saying you've got the science to prove that when you're connected energetically to a truth that you have and an emotion and creating an emotion and an energy with it, you tap into a frequency and yeah. you transmit it. Exactly. You broadcast it. So that was, inc that was like, yes. And so this is because people say, Oh, I don't need this meditation. I meditate. Or I yes, but everybody can say source. Everybody can say, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a specific frequency delivered in a certain way yeah. that then your brain recognizes and then it can find it on its own. That's mm -hmm. the idea. But I think this was also we were talking about the average person, you know, having to like think that they need the discipline or the time, yeah. you know, it's more about really uh, finding the right energy, <clears throat> you know, either it feels like it's the right thing or it doesn't. Yeah. And when it, when you do that, you start to be more specific. It's kind of like, why do I want to connect with the trees and nature to understand who I am? if I can connect directly with who I really am at the source mm. as I was my true essence. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So you start to be specific in your asking, you know, and the more specific you are, the faster you, it's like you're getting straight to the point. Mm. So your meditation is fast. Your asking is fast. Your manifesting is fast. Because you're just saying, because that's also what was happening when I was younger. I was like sensing, I was getting all kinds of guidance. And I'm like, wait, like, who's talking to me? Like, what, like, you know, like, is this me? Is this some ET? <laughs> you know, is this some angel? Like, 
even it was benevolent, but why? Like who? And so that's why you start to, at the end of the day, I am not interested from hearing the truth from my neighbor. I'm not saying you don't learn from people or you don't, you're not helped by people. I'm saying the real truth of who you are is to go back to your true essence, who you are as you were originally created, originally created as a pure essence. And we're not talking about past life. We're talking about an original essence. Mm-hmm. And you do that through this meditation, through this connection, connecting to source. Mm. Well, you're leading us right into the next topic by saying connecting to other beings. So do you connect with other beings in that space? Are you able to do that? Do you have experiences of that? Yeah. So so what happened when I was five, those beings that I connected with, I realized that it was kind of like we were the same stream of consciousness. It was like as if I was on this side of the veil in human form, and they were like my continuation, like it kept going on and on. And then I saw, even though they were different beings, meaning meaning individual entities, but it was the same stream of consciousness. And then I kind of saw, that's why it was very beautiful experience, because I felt that that was home, where I had come from. So I kind of could follow it and see where I could come from, like, from somewhere in the universe. And then I realized it felt so familiar, so good. It was more like, even as a five-year-old, it was like, oh, like, like, it makes sense. Kind of like that. It was that sort of like, this is who I am. This is what it is. Because the adults around me, they were like, what is that? You know, They were like bickering and like, and so because of that experience, I understood that the beings that are, that came forth or whatever that I was connecting with were what I call my spirit family, meaning it's like the same consciousness. And that was so important later, I realized at the time it was like, oh, okay, you know, I'm five years old, right? It's like, oh, you know, but it was later when I started connecting with other beings, they would come to me and I would get a download. And because I'm very sensitive, I can see the subtle energy. I could see them. I could sense them. And they were very different than what I had experienced at the age of five. Mm. And so, and so then I would recognize and I would be like, why, you know, I don't need to get into that. And so I feel that that experience at the age of five left that frequency signature in my brain so that I could recognize it so that I could go back to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you had contrast. So now it almost was like your baseline awareness for information beyond this sort of beta cognizant world that we live in, in 3d, it now gave you the baseline reference of like, this is you. So you know what's not you. Exactly. And I realized, so then I would see other beings and communicate with other beings. That's why I I wrote a lot about the different types of beings, because I I started to see beings that most people don't even talk about. They're like very far away in the universe from other universes. So, but then, like you were saying, I could discern they were not this. And I realized the most important message to of that experience is that yes it's okay to communicate with this being and that entity and this and that maybe because you're learning or maybe for you to know to not communicate you know um but the bottom line is for you if you are here to know who you are is to be able to go back to this original blueprint this original frequency from where you have come mm. And bring that forth, like through your human aspect. Because that's, so this means that 
you know, people say awakening or enlightened, like, what is that? Like, what are you awakening to? Yeah. You are awakening to who you really are originally before yeah. this human body came and said, oh, I want to be a, an author or a teacher or blah, blah, blah. This is your day job. This is like what people see on the outside. But what is the energy? What is the consciousness that is broadcasting this information right. so that you can have 10 people talking about abundance? But the way you talk about abundance is coming from that original signature. It's an authentic, it's divine, true. pure. And that's really the ultimate goal of being able to express that original essence through everything that you do. Yeah. So how does, um, how does your exploration into space and I've watched, um, a tear in the sky, most of it, and to be able to dive into, you know, what else is out there. And so what role does an extraterrestrial and knowing that there's other life out there, what role does that play then? Why is that important? Yes. So a lot of it has to do with me uh, trying to bring the truth, you know, that it's more than, hey, you know, the gray aliens are here to invade our planet and destroy. And uh, there is so much more that is out there that people don't, you know, know about. And so I use these films uh, always try to bring science as well as much as possible. Oh, yeah, to bring yeah I found it so fascinating how you triangulated to be able to get images of the same thing from different places so that, I mean, it's just like layering on the, the data so that you could create a compelling argument and proof. Exactly, exactly. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do with the films is to bring more information, more truth, more validation that, okay, we're not all crazy. There's something here going on. And so, uh, yeah, so working with scientists and doing it this way uh, is just part of the work. <laughs> yeah. What is? What are some of, I mean, maybe you can explain, maybe you've learned more about what it was that you guys saw in the sky with the, the area that was not sort of that looked like it was like the clouds parted and there was little particles or little dots and one appearing and then it kind of clouded over. Um, but uh, I know I'm getting specific, but that's specific to the movie. What have you found? Well, first of all, we were there only five days. And yes, it's true. We had an incredible, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, you know, from optical uh, equipment to infrared to, you know, FLIR cameras, which is like military grade uh, to radiation. I mean, all si sorts of things. We were in three locations, like you said, but still we are civilians, right? And in five days, five days, we captured like hundreds of hours of data. So, and very anomalous things. So for example, um, you know, things that kind of would show up, like make a U-turn and leave. <laughs> Things that would appear in the middle of the screen, rotate, and then like disappear. Yeah. I mean, this is all, you know, again, in the movie, we didn't uh, change anything. This is all the raw footage that's in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I feel like just from that, we've accomplished so much because of what, especially the government's telling us right now, like, we don't know, we don't have data. It's like, okay, but we're civilians. We went out and we did that. But the biggest thing is the one you mentioned. At the end, we captured, so the camera gets triggered when there isn't something that is not a bird, it's not a, a plane, because it, the, the, the system knows it's, it's none of those things. And so it gets triggered, the camera gets triggered, and we have that video. And when we, we slowed it down, we saw, wait, <laughs> because when, when it got triggered, we couldn't see anything. But then when we analyzed it, we saw that literally it was some sort of a cloud. It opens and closed and it revealed 50 to 100 uh, reflective objects, like actual objects. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them pop out of the cloud. We don't know what, you know. So at the same time, it correlates with radar. Uh, radar also picks up exactly some sort of blob in that exact same spot. 
uh, ra- we have a, a crazy radiation, a gamma ray of like, I think it was 43 or something insane. The normal is like three. And so now I'm working with hardcore scientists. Okay. These aren't like scientists who are like, yeah, we believe in your weekend warrior scientists with cameras. There's so, in fact, you, you, we couldn't even talk about consciousness. Like, I mean, very like nuts and bolts scientists. They analyze the heck out of this thing. It's like, maybe it's a solar flare. Maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Nothing is checking out. We presented it to hundreds of scientists and experts at a conference. No one has an explanation. We said, okay, well, let's try to keep getting more data. Maybe we can get satellite images because we know exactly where it is. We have the location, the size, everything. And so we ask for satellite images, to, you know, from private organizations and governmental organizations. Either they didn't have them or they wouldn't give it to us. <laughs> so then we file a FOIA request. We say, okay, a Freedom, Freedom of Information Act request. So they have to give us. It's a governmental agency. So they come back and they say, we are, you know, the geospatial agency. We collect all the satellite images. We do have <laughs> uh, the images of those particular coordinates, the time space uh, that you're mentioning. However, we can't give them to you because uh, they're exempt, meaning classified. (laughs) That's not really freedom (laughs) of information. Right? Freedom of chosen information. Exactly. But what does that tell you? Well, it's like pleading the fifth in 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 a case, you know? Pleading the fifth is about the same as confessing. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, so it was like, okay, so then we did capture something extraordinary. So what do you call something that opens and closes and then has like a bunch of actual objects? We were able to measure them that pop out of it. Uh, I mean, the first word that came to mind when I was watching it, I was like, it's like a portal, you know? Of course. And then you guys said maybe a black hole or a wormhole. You said a wormhole. I mean, yeah. I mean, if it opens and closes, it feels almost like some kind of wormhole portal that is like, oh, this is another galaxy of some sort. And these are all stars in it. But the question is, why did it open? And also, not only that, these aren't stars because the, the radar doesn't pick up on radiation or light. It picks up on objects, like reflective objects. So these were actual objects. Oh, so reflective. It can it can pick up on that on reflective versus yes. reflecting. Yes, same, same. Uh, it's, okay, it's, so it's, a sun, it's, but a sun is object. like sun is like projecting or like reflecting sun. Like if it's a craft and a light's hitting it, that feels like reflecting. Yeah, same thing. But it, my point is, it, these were objects. Like it okay. wasn't because if if it was, let's say, a burst of radiation, let's say then it would be everywhere. It would be on the whole frame, right? Because we're taking a picture. So if it's radiation, it's not going to be like (laughs) in this one spot. Yeah. And it's not a sun either. It's not a star. It's not a star because it wouldn't do that. And you see what? It's not light because it was reflective object. So that's what I'm saying. What is it? Yeah. And why did it, yeah. Why did it open? What came in or what went out? Exactly. And so, and after it closes, you literally see that in the movie, you see like a couple of them actually pop out. It's <laughs> almost like, cause they appear. It's like within that little space, it's like a dot just appears. So it's yeah. almost like something left. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Because they're like, Oh, let's open this portal up and then go back in, close it up. Yeah. Back to some galaxy we've not yet discovered <laughs> or know about. Exactly. Wow. So that's like, to me, that was like a huge what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm fascinated. Since I was a kid, I, I looked up to the stars and I would just think to myself, it goes on forever. Yeah. But what's at the end of for- nothing? It goes on forever. Do you have a theory on like multiverse, like simulation, 
Um, like, do you have a theory on, on how this universe or beyond materializes? Yeah. It's definitely a multiverse. I mean, I think there's an infinite number of universes, but not in the way people think. Like, you know how people think that, oh, there's another one of you in another universe doing the same thing, like a parallel universe. To right. me, that doesn't make any sense because it would be like, what's the point? Why would you have a bunch of you doing the same thing? So, you know what I mean? Creation is purposeful. The idea is there's one of you doing this here, but there's another aspect of you could be doing something else. So, but anyway, for me, the universal organization is more um, planetary systems within galactic systems, within universes, and each universe is within multiverses. So it's 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 more of a um, of a fractal existence. And then you see the geometry, you see perfect geometry, you see the harmonics between uh, the macro and the micro. And so, but going to your question, is this a simulation? So it's interesting because I don't see it at all as a simulation, like it's a computer uh, generated thing and it's all fake. However, <laughs> I feel we are inside a sort of a network a network of information which creates this particular reality that is both that is part of a larger uh i don't think it's a, it's a, it's i think it's more of a divine order that's my take on it there's a larger universal intelligence that is guiding this now there may be some extraterrestrial manipulating you know, the reality that we exist in, but they're not the creators. This is not where it ends. There's a much larger universal organization that is divinely orchestrated because there's too much evidence mm -hmm. of divine intelligence. You know, it's too much. And so it's at the same time that a lot of it is pre- uh, directed like it's almost like you have a prenatal contract to come in here and carry out this contract and at the same time you are creating it as you go along meaning you you create your reality otherwise we'd just be robots we'll just be machines like it wouldn't matter yeah. what happens to you because it, oh it's predestined it's already part of the computer the simulation so what's the yeah. point why should i intend uh, to to have a house or to do this if it's if it's preordained. It does feel like there to me like there's a continuation of your energy. Yes, and it's it's a continuation. Now there's lives, right? So it looks like it ends, but it's not. That's just a fractal nature of it. Like there's like the fractal of like your choices within your life, and then there's the larger fractal nature of like lives yes 100%. and then maybe there's the next fractal nature of entities in some kind of evolution and then beyond that you know right that's how it feels to me versus yeah i mean there's, there's a lot of evidence of some level of simulation theory just because patterns are so prevalent like even when we look into ancient civilizations and the way that they're able to use the stars perfectly and geometry. If we're a pattern, patterns make patterns. So the fact that we can all fit into these sort of archetypes and various different things feels very like zeros and ones. Yes. But think about this. If that's the case, then what's the point of your incarnation? What's the point? If it, if it's already kind of a simulation it mean it tell it's going to tell you where you're going because that's what a parent pattern does. Mm -hmm. And what's the point? Yeah. Why are you? You see, and so I can see, so, how, I can see how a pattern would would just continue just because it's got it's like you kick the ball down the hill and it's just rolling, right? It's just happening. But why did? the pattern begin in the first place. Yeah. And I like what you said, how there's different layers or levels of fractals, mm -hmm. but then you got to the beings and then what's beyond that. Right. I don't know. 
You see what I mean? So to me, there is a divine orchestration of the much, much, much larger picture. Otherwise, we'd be gone by now. I mean, if we were just, you know, um, managed by a group of like, you know, strange entities, aliens or something, it's like, you know, it, 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 it doesn't uh, make sense when you see so much organization on a much higher scale like there is a divine intelligence that's embedded in everything yeah even in those beings that are trying to manipulate whatever yeah because they're part of the divine intelligence mm -hmm. so then what's the point of all of this well so i feel that creation or existence of the universe of who we are is the actual DNA of existence is to thrive. You know, the baby, when you're born, you don't say, oh, I want to kill myself. You're born. You're like, hey, here I am. You know, give me food. I want, I'm here to grow. I'm here to love. I'm here to be loved. That's what the baby is, right? Mm -hmm. So that's just that is a witness, if you will, is, is testimony, I mean, of what creation is you know an intelligent being is an example of how the universe is thriving here's another part of creation that wants to expand explore grow up evolve so on and so forth so that's the nature of the universe and that's the purpose of the universe mm -hmm. so anything that goes against it meaning if you are self-destructive or destructing other people, you know, infringing on people's free will or what have you, you're kind of going against the universal order, which is to continuously thrive, give you the ability to create yeah. as you wish, as long as you continue allowing the universe to thrive through you, through your creation mm -hmm. forever and ever. So that's that's kind of the concept of good and evil. Like, how do you know what's good and bad and who's to decide that, you know, and why is killing people like a criminal act or, you know what I mean? Like, that's because it, it's very simple. It, it, anything that's going against the principle of thriving and evolving. Yeah. It, <laughs> well, it's like when you come up against a pattern. Yeah. Exactly. And so if you ignore it, you're going against something trying to ask you to grow and evolve. Exactly. It's like exactly. when you get through this, you'll be happier. You'll be in more abundance. You'll be more joyful. You'll be more peaceful. But you keep saying no. And if you're going against the point of this reality with, that you need to say yes to. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's that's why it's actually. Yeah pretty simple we're the ones that complicate things <laughs> it's very it's actually pretty simple anything that allows you to thrive to be who you are to continue evolving the universe through your creation you decide then you're in the flow and that's why the universe will support you it will like just be in constant oh, flow it is like crazy i was uh Actually, that was a funny, funny example. I was on vacation last weekend and I was like, the flight home, it was in, in Mexico and Cabo and it was beautiful, the house, beach and golf and it was awesome. And I'm like, man, I wish there was another direct flight home. There was only a 1 p.m. direct flight home. It'd be nice if there was like a four or five o'clock direct flight home. That way we could re fully relax and play around a golf and like have a whole Sunday on the way to the airport. I told the driver, turn around. The flight got <laughs> delayed till 515. I was and it was like 1130. I was like, turn around. <laughs> and I was like, you know, oh my God, thank you. Like the universe delivers to you in ways that you couldn't create on your own. Exactly. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's way bigger than you. Like I couldn't have got American Airlines to delay the flight by four and a half hours. I exactly. couldn't have. That's what I'm saying. So when you are in that flow, meaning I'm here to thrive, I'm here yeah. to give love, I'm yeah. here to receive love. That's like the baby. Just look at the baby. I'm here to take, I want food because I need to grow. I want, I want to take care of me, of my body. 
Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so you're here to nourish yourself, to allow yourself to grow and express yourself just like the baby. I want to laugh. I want to have my own personality or whatever, you know, then you are in the flow and then everything comes. When you start saying no, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, or let me go and teach you what belief system you should have, what God, you know, you're supposed to, it's like, what? Like, no, (laughs) you know? So, Mm -hmm. so, so it's actually, like I said, it's quite simple. I mean, it's quite simple as a principle, but in practical, you know, you know, people, yeah, right now, because of the number of years and generations of being programmed. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You have like such a, it's rare to come across people that are able to take complicated concepts and make them comprehensive. And you do a really good job of that. Thank you so much. And what yeah. you're doing is so amazing. So I'm, I so appreciate your work and I appreciate this opportunity. I hope we were able to spread some love. Sure. <laughs> well, here's the thing that is true. And I'm so glad that we had the conversation and you were able to articulate and really help me comprehend this concept. But this will create change and the frequency, because the frequency that we're in is in our truth and our curiosity. And we're emitting a certain frequency right now that even if if people just listen, they get something from it, even if they don't understand it's going in, it's resonating on some level within you. I really, really believe that. A hundred percent. That's how energy works. Yeah. And that's how, you know, you just have to allow the frequencies to be embedded and, you know, just uh, follow the flow. (laughs) Yeah. Getting it all to come online. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful job. Well, thank you, Caroline. That was really wonderful. And, um, are you making another movie? I feel like you just keep making films. Is there one on the on the way? Yeah, I have two actually. Um, well, this one of them is actually c- continuing where we left off with Tear in the Sky because we, um, you know, we found this wormhole. So the next one is on wormholes, cool. uh, but a ho- in a whole new way. It's not just UFOs. It's it's very very cool. It's about the structure of the universe and stuff. And then I'm doing another one that's a completely different subject. I don't know if I want to bring it up because it's actually about um, child trafficking. So oh, that's a big deal, though. That is a yeah. the mo- I think it's becoming a pretty strong awareness within our reality that this is rampant. Yes, exactly. So I'm shocked with the things that I've discovered. And I'm working with someone incredible who actually conducted 70 rescue missions, rescued hundreds of children. So this is very real and it's in my, like, it's not hearsay. So um, it just kind of, I felt like I needed to. Wow. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's so dark. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think the Epstein stuff kind of brought some of, it to light a little bit just about how kind of dark and gross the this sort of like there's another world of people that operate in these spaces and you know whether it's for weird fetishes or power or shoot I don't know if like adrenal chrome is a real thing with child's blood and things like that or um if it's just um <clears throat> human beings being hijacked by other entities and they're doing such awful things. I don't really, I mean, obviously I I'm just rambling off a bunch of things, but basically I can't comprehend how people can do these things. They don't feel very human to me. I feel like everybody is good. They have bad programming, Yes, but maybe there's some people that go beyond that. Maybe they're not really that human. Maybe they're, reptilian maybe they're i don't know i don't know do you get into all that stuff in the film a little bit or Uh, actually um the only way i could deal with this is to focus on the solution because 
there's another horrible, um, you know, <laughs> data is that the more they rescued, the more they would find networks and stuff. So it's really about um, the level of consciousness that humanity is at. And so in the film and in the work that I'm doing in that whole um, area, we are bringing a lot of tools to change and like a, a lot of uh, resources and things that people can do to help themselves after mm -hmm. the fact, but also to avoid that, to try to really heal yeah. uh, what can get a human to even think that way. Yeah. So we're going back to the, to the root cause of the trauma. Oh, that's even important. those perpetrators are also um have also been violated and and you know right. as well right what gets them to do something like that yeah oh wow well so hopefully yeah. it'll be more you know hopeful but the subject is yeah. very, very painful yeah <laughs> well it's no different than when we go into aspects within ourselves that are not beautiful and yeah. not good and they need healing and they need shifting it's like it's not so good at first but you know, bringing it to light helps to create the alchemy needed for exactly. it to change. Exactly. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Caroline. Well, thank it's beautiful you. to talk to you and good work. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.